So welcome everyone to the further evaluation workshop for the Cape Foulweather Marine Conservation Area. My name is Andy Lanier. I'm the Marine Affairs Coordinator for the Department of Land Conservation and Development. And we are all here today to talk about the Cape Foulweather Marine Conservation Area proposal. To get us started, I'm going to just briefly review the agenda for the day. Uh, We'll start with welcome introductions. Uh, we will then have an opportunity for a public comment right at the beginning. Um, if we don't spend a lot of time on that issue, uh, I may do what I did this morning and allow a public comment opportunity uh, to follow our discussion uh, later this afternoon. Uh, that seemed to be supported by folks uh, this morning. Um, and give them an opportunity to uh, voice uh, something that they would wanna say after they've listened to our discussion today. I'll then uh, briefly give a, a tribal consultation overview reminder, and then we'll uh, go into a Rocky Habitat proposal presentation by the proposal team uh, for the Cape Fowl weather proposal. We'll take a short break following that and then we'll launch into uh, the majority of our time today, which will be focused around discussion of the site, the considerations that were identified in the original evaluation and any uh, recommendations for addressing those. Uh, we'll conclude with a wrap up and next steps and then adjourn for the day. Uh, I'm hopeful that we've allocated enough time for this discussion so that we're not pressed for time at all. And um, with that, what I'm going to do is move on into introductions. And I'm going to stop my share so I can see you all in front of me. Um, and I'd like to begin with our panelists, uh, specifically the Cape Fowl Weather Proposal Team. So I will start with uh, those of you I see on my little tiled squares up at the top. I think, Steve, you're, you're first. Oh, you, and you're muted. Uh, thank you, uh, Andy. I'm Steve Griffiths, and I'm a board member with Audubon Society of Lincoln City, and uh, have been working with our team uh, for the last couple of years on both of these proposals. This thank one, Cape Lookout, one that we're doing tomorrow. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And Dennis, you're next on my screen. Hello, everybody, and thanks to those in public service here who are spending so many hours <laughs> on this venue here. I'm Dennis White, um, and I'm also on the board of uh, Audubon, which has submitted this proposal, and also the president of um, Friends of Otter Rock, which is uh, written in as a as a resource for interpretation in the in the proposal. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Kent, you're next. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Kent Doughty. I'm the Coastal Conservation Coordinator for Lincoln City Audubon, and uh, I've been uh, a big part of writing the proposal um, and working on it, and glad to see everybody. Moses, long time no see. I will let you know I'll have my video feed off at times. Uh, I'm having to run off battery, so I'm trying to save it. Thank you, Kent. It's always risky to have to run off battery. Uh, Don. Yeah, I'm Dawn Biascusa, and I'm the president of uh, Audubon Lake and City, and I'm a little under the weather today, so I'm going to be letting my team do most of the talking. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here and for being so involved and interested all these years. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Kent, did I miss anybody from your team? No, I think you got everybody. Okay. Next, I'm going to go through... Uh, my agency colleagues, um, who will be the other part of the panel for today. And I'll begin with Laurel. Good afternoon, everybody. Laurel Hillman, Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, Ocean Shore Resource Specialist. And Jared. Hey, everyone. Jared Manji, the Park Manager of the Beverly Beach State Park Management Unit. Good to see you there, Dennis. 
I see Sean Stevenson is with us, but he's not in his chair. So I'm going to move on to Dave Fox. Yeah, hi, I'm Dave Fox with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Marine Resources Program. And I'm going to get up really quick to get a cup of coffee. In my All chair. right, thanks, Dave. <laughs> okay, and uh, Moses. Hi folks, Michael Moses, uh, former Rocky Shores coordinator, current Estuary and Resilience Coordinator at DLCD. I'm glad to see all of you again. Okay, now I'm next I'm going to move into uh, members of the public for today and I see Peggy first. I'm Peggy Joyce and I sit on the board of the uh, OPEC. Welcome, Jim Carlson. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Jim Carlson, um, Coast Range Association, uh, Marine person. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, Roy Anderson. Hey, everyone. Roy Anderson. I'm the program coordinator for Friends of Otter Rock. Welcome. Jamie. Jamie Faraday, uh, OPAC, uh, Coastal Member at Large. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Joe Levisite. Hey, everybody. I'm Joe Levisite, staff scientist at Portland Audubon, and um, also on OPAC. And uh, I've been involved in this process a long time and looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Nora. Hi, I'm Nora Sherwood. I'm with the Audubon Society in Lincoln City. Great, and Charlie. Hey, Charlie Plyben, um, Ocean Policy Advisory Council, um, Oregon Policy Manager of Surfrider Foundation and um, former Rocky Habitat Working Group member. All right, thank you. I believe that's everyone for, as members of the public. Let me circle back around to Sean Stevenson. Yeah, this is Sean Stevens, and sorry, I got a call. Just, just I, I heard my name. Uh, I'm a wildlife biologist for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Oh, I think I also missed uh, Joseph Yorin. Joe, you wanna? Yes, Joseph Yorin, uh, Audubon Society of Lincoln City. All right, and I did see that uh, Amanda McNabb joined us. So, Mandy, thanks for being with us today. Not a problem. Okay, uh, without further ado, I will go ahead and move forward on our agenda. Let me share my screen again. All right, uh, before we really get going, I'd like to just cover some basic ground rules for our discussion today. These are all pretty much common sense, but we wanna have a productive discussions and to help facilitate that, I wanna make sure that we're all respectful of each other, that we are active listeners um, and we really try and absorb what others are saying, uh, no personal attacks. And if you have an opinion, please share with us the, the why, the cause behind that opinion so that we can understand kind of the, the focus of the issue from your perspective. Um, and where possible as, as panelists, please leave your camera on during the discussion as that will help us to focus attention and keep our conversation um, as coherent as we can in, in the virtual world that we do have today. Um, so without further ado, uh, we have a public comment opportunity on the books, uh, please uh, in, enter in the chat to let me know that you would like to uh, provide a public comment and I will call you in the order that I received the request. Uh, Roy, why don't you go ahead? Thanks, Andy. Yeah, so, Again, I'm the program coordinator for Friends of Otter Rock. And as Dennis mentioned during his introduction, Friends of Otter Rock are written into the proposal as a resource for interpretive materials. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about that to provide you all with some more context. So um, just about our organization first, we're, we're a recently formed organization that um, has just received funding this past year. Um, so I'm the first program coordinator to come on and in our work plan, the number one objective we have um, this year is to launch our first volunteer interpretive program at Otter Rock Marine Reserve. And um, so this is gonna involve volunteers uh, on the ground, talking to visitors and promoting good stewardship practices and interpreting the local wildlife uh, at Otter Rock. Um, and our program is focused on Otter Rock, us being friends of Otter Rock, but uh, as we all know, organisms don't exact, exactly observe political boundaries. So there is a lot of crossover in our interpretive materials and um, the species at Cape Foulweather. So for example, um, some of the species that we focus on in our interpretive program are whales and uh, harbor seals and kelp beds, all of which are found in both Otter Rock Marine Reserve and in the um, area outlined in this proposal for Cape Foulweather. Also, uh, there's crossover in the, um, the geology of the two areas. Uh, there's a common history of volcanism. Um, and we go into how the rocks formed at each of the different sites. And that's shared between both Otter Rock and Cape Foulweather. Also, the history of the area, um, it's hard to, to separate the two apart. They have a shared history, and we go into that in our interpretive materials, um, focusing on the indigenous groups that have been present in this area since time immemorial, and um, also the history of European contact. So we talk about uh, Captain Cook and how he first saw land um, at Cape Foulweather, and that's one of the stories we focus on. Um, and also ecological threats. Uh, those are common between Otter Rock and Cape Foulweather, things like climate change, ocean acidification, plastic pollution. Um, it's not unique to our site. So yeah, Otter, Friends of Otter Rock and our interpretive program is a resource for this proposal um, to provide interpretation for Cape Foulweather. So thank you all to, uh, thanks to everyone for putting this proposal together and for everyone for providing this forum. I appreciate everybody's work. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else that would like to provide a comment? So, um, the way I am managing our discussion today, we are hoping to limit uh, the participants to panelists, which are really the, um, the main proposers, as well as the agencies who are responding to the, the proposal team or the individual about um, the considerations that were identified. As such, um, and I know that may be frustrating for others in the audience, I, I do want to offer like I did, if, if folks are willing, a public comment period at the after our discussion, uh, in case something comes up. Um, do I have the groups kind of go ahead to do so if we have time available on our agenda? Just thumbs up, um, nods. Okay, great. So um, I'll, I'll pay attention to how our discussion is progressing and I will hope to be able to provide that opportunity um, following, the, the, following our discussion. Um, I do want to pause and note that uh, we do as the state of Oregon representatives have a government to government responsibility to conduct uh, tribal consultation that can either be in the form of just coordination or uh, official consultation. And we as agencies uh, will be doing so in regards to these proposals. We will at least offer the opportunity uh, for our tribal members to participate. If there's anybody on the line today who's a representative of a, of a tribal government, I would allow 
you to speak up now if you'd like to make a comment um, or just flag that as something that, that we agencies will be doing. Uh, this will likely occur between uh, OPAC meetings once there's a packet of information for our tribal governments to review. Uh, so that's just a flag for everybody that uh, this uh, will be happening and uh, we as agencies will will bring back anything um, from that consultative effort to the Ocean Policy Advisory Council uh, as part of their decision making this fall. So moving forward then, uh, we are at the time in our agenda where I will stop sharing my screen and, and allow Kent to uh, share his uh, for a presentation of the Cape Fowl weather proposal. Um, I do just want to pause for a second to note we've we've had uh, Blake Helms from DSL join us. Do you want to introduce yourself, Blake? Hey guys, sorry I'm late. Uh, Blake Helm, proprietary specialist, uh, policy and planning uh, for the Department of State Lands. Happy to be here. Thank you, Blake. And Kent, I'm going to make you a co-host so you can share your screen. Well, thanks, Andy, and thanks to all those at DS, DLCD for having this workshop, uh, and a huge thanks to all the agencies here um in the immense amount of time that you've put in and to audience members particularly opac uh, my apologies for my video feed i'm trying to save battery and i've noticed too if i have my video feed on it uh, my sound quality goes out a little bit um, but uh, today uh, we're presenting on the cape fowl weather complex uh, just to back up a slight bit um, who we are Lincoln, Audubon Society of Lincoln City has been around for about 17 years. It's a chapter of the National Audubon Society and its core programs are education, citizen science, and conservation. Uh, we serve Lincoln and Tillamook counties. Uh, we're a volunteer group with 501c3 status, the board of directors, and about 150 members that support our programs. Um, this proposal is not just about Lincoln City Audubon, though. There's very wide community support. Um, as Roy mentioned, Friends of Otter Rock um, brings a wealth of interpretive experience as well as organizing skills, and we're very welcome and gratitude to have them uh, supporting this proposal. Uh, we've also Coast Watch, we have close ties with residents in Morocco neighborhood that sits atop Cape Fowl Weather and Little Whale Cove Associ Neighborhood Association have both provided uh, letters of support with uh, many residents willing to step up and participate in uh, implementation. Also schools, faith-based groups. Um, it's really, it, it really is a community, a community place-based uh, uh, proposal. And uh, I'm very honored to be able to shepherd it with all these people. Um, can, is my, maybe I'll slide that over a little bit. <clears throat> what we're calling the Cape Fowl Weather Complex, uh, you can see here in blue, um, is extends from the north side of Whale Cove Habitat Refuge, which is another designation area. And I, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'll show it. Uh, it extends southward to the north end of Otter Crest Marine Garden and then just about seven tenths of a mile south of our plan area sits Otter Rock Marine Garden. There are also a, about 31 offshore rocks and islands and a small sections of uh, the shore that are part of the Oregon Islands have National Wildlife Habitat Refuge. So that's the reason why we call it a complex is we've got um, a number of uh, other designations in the area. And this, does, this proposal uh, would ecologically tie together these various designations as well as contribute to management efficiency, 
And really, I see it as creating a learning opportunity to the public to understand how we manage different uh, marine areas and, and the subtleties of the different uh, uh, designations. Cape Fowl weather is an amazing place, not only for the fantastic views, uh, it has the largest kelp forest north of Cape Arago. Um, it's also uh, home to black oyster catchers uh, and a number of other seabird colonies. Uh, the, it's got the Oregon's largest colony of pelagic cormorants. And one of the main uses of the area is it's a comparison site area for evaluating the nearby Cape Otter, Otter Rock Marine Reserve. Other uses in the area include commercial, recreational, and charter fishing, bird watching. Whale watching is very popular, both uh, in, on individual recreational boats from the shore, as well as charter boats. And it's a place where there's a lot of spiritual contemplation. Um, it is uh, in one of the way, main ways uh, the public and residents uh, access is from the visual connections provided um, along the stunning Otter Crest Drive. And uh, if you've never gotten out and walked or even drove uh, Otter Crest Drive, uh, I highly recommend it. It's uh, just sensory. Uh, it's a really great way to connect with this area. So why a marine conservation area at Cape Bowweather? First off, in an MCA would preserve the high quality intact habitat. Um, it is uh, a very unique location. And an MCA offers the opportunity for a really an excellent platform as I see it for collaborative kelp forest management. And we all know that uh, we're facing a crisis with kelp in the Oregon coast. Um, in Cape Powell, there's no exception. Um, <clears throat> a site designation really brings focus. It fosters volunteers, grants, brings in research opportunities, and most importantly, um, it's a rallying point for community engagement. Of the three designation types, we chose Marine Conservation Area because of its regulatory flexibility uh, would fit with having an open harvest regime. That's important for a comparison site. Um, outreach was a key component of our Cape Fowl Weather campaign, um, and I think the results of that outreach are, are impressive. 235 people signed an online petition for designated Cape Fowl Weather as a marine conservation area. 166 of those provided uh, unique comments, written comments. Nearly 600 people watched a video um, called Oregon Coast Rocks about Cape Fowl weather and our proposal. There were three newspaper articles. The Depot Bay City Council endorsed our campaign, uh, stating that MCA designation at Cape Fowl weather will benefit tourism, which is vital to our local economy. The city of Newport also provided a letter of support. Residents in Morocco neighborhood many of whom fish from the rocky shores express their strong support for this proposal. There was a broad range of support, neighborhood groups, local governments, recreational users, schools, faith-based groups, watershed councils, environmental groups. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we received a letter of support from a grant from the natural resources manager at Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron. And in that letter, he expressed the importance of the Cape, uh, the kelp beds at Cape Fowl weather for the tribe. So uh, with our stakeholder outreach, we listened to the stakeholders and addressed their concerns. It was actually the stakeholders that uh, encouraged us to include the kelp beds as part of our proposed area. Um, other examples of concerns, the fishing and charter boat operators inquired how an MCA designation would affect their activities. And we were able to assure them that no change is being proposed in commercial or recreational fishing. So our site specific goal is in coordination with management of nearby marine designations, conserve the ecological functions and rocky habitat resources 
in order to provide long-term ecological, economic, and social benefits. So we recognize the importance of the area as a uh, comparison area, and we essentially bake that into our, um, our site goal. Also, the, cons the ecological ecosystem-based management principle that economic and social benefits are really just as important and equally vital as ecological benefits. To meet this goal, we provided a number of recommendations. And first off, I'll, I'll preface that with, they are just recommendations or suggestions. Um, we fully expect the recommendations to be reviewed, revised um, during rulemaking and implementation if this is approved. Um, so we see it very much as a, a working living document. We emphasize education, stewardship, and community engagement rather than a regulatory approach to management. Uh, community engagement, uh, community education recommendations include building curriculums for local uh, schools and higher learning ins institutions, um, <clears throat> our monitoring, the monitoring uses, utilizes community science as well as ODFW has a very rigorous monitoring program in place in the area as far as its comparison studies. A key component of community engagement is we were recommending a biennial State of the Cape Symposium where all interests can come together and, and discuss the implementation of the plan, what's needed in adaptive management strategies. We're proposing no changes to commercial or recreational harvest regulations, no change to commercial or recreational harvest of most invertebrates, uh, harvesting of clams, dungeness crab, red rock crab, mussels, piddocks, scallops, squid, and shrimp would all remain open. Um, that's similar to uh, the regulations for invertebrates in the nearby Boiler Bay research area. We are recommending a closure for personal harvest of kelp, and I'll go into uh, modifications in a moment. So the balance of our proposal, uh, or the balance of this presentation is to highlight our responses to the working group's considerations uh, that were in the final recommendations. Uh, we've submitted uh, to written, rec written responses to those considerations about a year ago prior to the, I think the last time the working group meeting was April 29th, 2021. So um, we're kind of coming full circle in a, in a year here. Um, but I, I'll walk through some of those considerations and our responses to it. Um, one of the first considerations of the working group was that the proposal maintains status quo with minimal, minimal harvest restrictions. Uh, as I mentioned, our, both our site goal and the proposed management rec recommendations recognize the value of Cape Fowl weather area as a comparison site for the nearby Outer Rock Marine Reserve. In practical terms, this means maintaining an open harvest regime. Our goal reflects that strategy's emphasis on ecosystem-based management. And a key principle of that ecosystem-based concept is again, that economic and social benefits are just as important as ecological benefits. And they are fully compatible in my view. A suite of ecosystem services ensures the community and all aspects of the community will stay engaged with implementation. And it's, uh, I think, strengthens the potential for the proposal to be a success. Um, conservation's compatibility with sustained harvest is compatible. And it's a keystone concept really with uh, natural resource management in Oregon. This concept's uh, embedded in ODFW's mission statement. Education and stewardship are big changes from status quo. Another consideration was enforcement may be challenged by capacity, safety, and costs. Uh, it was noted that enforcement of invertebrate and algae harvest regulations, if applied in subtitle areas, 
would be challenging offshore. We acknowledge the need for in enforcement capacity to grow as we add to the inventory of special designations up and down the coast. Uh, we would suggest that uh, the, the, this capacity issue of adding enforcement is best addressed at a, a broader scale and brought to OPAC's attention as a need for the implementation of the full strategy. Um, this would be more appropriate than at the site base. Um, in terms of uh, enforcement, we do suggest a modification to our re recommendation number 16, the invertebrate harvest, to only have that, uh, those harvest restrictions apply to intertidal areas. This would reduce the complexity of enforcement where the point of compliance is typically dockside. So a boat coming in with invertebrates, um, it would be hard for an enforcement officer to pinpoint where that came from. So um, subtitle areas are typically harvested from a boat. So uh, we would just go with statewide regs for invertebrate harvest and subtitle. Um, we're also recommending a change to our recommendation number 17, a closure of personal harvest kelp only be applied um, in, in the subtitle areas. It, actually, I think I may have stayed that wrong, let me back up a moment. So invertebrate harvest uh, restrictions would only apply in intertidal areas. It would be statewide regulations for subtitle areas. With regards to kelp harvest for personal use, um, that would be closed as our recommendation within subtitle areas. Um, that's in keeping with where overgrazing by urchins is occurring and fits better with the regulatory framework. Uh, it would be standard rules for intertidal. So well-trained well -trained volunteers can educate users to reduce violations stemming from informed, uninformed visitors. Stewards can act as observers but we do concur that good training is essential. We suggest collaboration among community groups and agencies to establish trainings that are clear and consistent on communications of state park rules and other rules to keep volunteers safe, as well as to provide the best interaction and a positive experience with visitors. Together, let's find ways to add capacity both now and into the future. Um, another consideration moving along uh, is that perhaps our recommendations were too ambitious. And we propose, we're, we're, we're requesting that the recommendation on socioeconomic studies and the recommendation for invasive species monitoring both be withdrawn as uh, they are region wide issues rather than site specific. Uh, there was a clarif another consideration in the working group's uh, recommendations was a clarification on the level of support and expectations for monitoring and signage. First off, it's our expectation that implementation of this designation would occur over time and that time would allow for building capacity both within the agencies and the community needs to build capacity too. Um, it's, we don't anticipate everything happening straight out of the gates. Community involve, involvement at Cape Fowl Weather Complex uh, can add capacity, provided that the proper training and, and volunteer management is provided. And I think uh, <clears throat> examples of that is uh, what's happening right now in, in the newly initiated programs at Friends of Outer Rock is a great example. Another example of community adding capacity is with Black Oyster Catcher Monitoring, uh, Portland Audubon Society's uh, Black Oyster Catcher Project has a long standing track record of good community science, uh, rigorous data, uh, and uh, also evaluating the effectiveness of that monitoring program. So in our proposal, I think maybe one of the things that uh, would could have been confusing is we listed cooperators, potential cooperators, and that included the agencies. That was mostly in response to the proposal template asked us to do so. 
but we clearly stated in the proposal also that uh, by listing it wasn't an endorsement or a commitment. With regards to signage for Cape Fowl weather, uh, the signage we see uh, being would be along the county road Ottercrest Drive, and we've communicated with the county, and they have in place uh, protocols for interpretive signage adding. So um, we do not expect the agencies to fund the signage, and we would be seeking outside funding for that. Um, and I will mention that Lincoln City Audubon um, has recently completed a very successful signage project in cooperation with U.S. Fish and Wildlife at the Siletz Bay National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's a great opportunity for an interpretive. Marine reserve perceptions uh, was voiced as an issue by the working group. And we wrote our proposal with consideration of the Otter Rock Marine Reserve, and the need to maintain the Cape Fowlweather area as a comparison area. Um, the MCA, our goal, acknowledges the importance of it as a, as a marine design, as a comparison area. And really it's their number one uh, recommendation that it be maintained as a comparison area. But misperceptions are best addressed by engaging the community in local management. And that's exactly what our proposal intends to do. Community engagement, including our uh, State of the Cape Symposium, provides a variety of interests, a, a place to engage in dialogue, in addition to establishing a shared understanding of local management. The education programs within this proposal are not just about the Cape Fowler plan area, but we really are planned to address all the designations in the area. So it's a, it's a learning opportunity for the public, again, to understand all the different um, designations. And particularly, uh, we see an, a nexus with the Marine Reserve is having the Cape Fowler MCA would be an education point to inform the public about what a comparison area is, why it's important, and how it's used. The, the plan areas um, were mentioned also as a consideration. Um, I think, I think it, we've noted in our written responses that the landward boundary we are proposing as the mean high water mark. Um, so I think that that was simply a correction. I think that uh, it probably doesn't, it doesn't require further dialogue, unless I think people think otherwise. Uh, with regards to the seaward extent, um, our area does encompass the kelp forests, the kelp grows in subtidal reefs. And we see that the, there's a nexus between the intertidal and the subtitles areas um, and we're facing a kelp crisis um, and we see a, a designation at this area as an excellent platform for cooperative uh, kelp management as well as public education on this crisis. Um, we really need innovative partnerships between the public and agencies to tackle climate change issues like this kelp crisis and an MCA brings a focus and a shared vision. Our proposal as written is consistent with the principles that are in the strategy. Uh, to quote the strategy, the interconnected relationships between rocky shoreline areas, offshore sites, and submerged rocky habitats warrants related areas be managed as an ecological unit. Subtitle, uh, inclusion uh, within marine des rocky habitat designations. This is not a new precedent and setting. Um, Gregory Point Marine Reserve Area is 89% of the area's subtitle. Cape Arago Marine Research Area has a maximum depth of 19 meters. Um, so uh, there are other examples within the inventory. So in conclusion, we wanna emphasize our management recommendations are consistent with the intent of the strategy to develop and implement an inventory of special places that would benefit from site-based management. Our recommendations align well with the strategy's policies. 
and our stake, stake, sorry, <laughs> excuse me, our stakeholder outreach has sparked a high level of community interest, and we want to keep building that momentum. A marine conservation area designation provides focus, incentive, and a shared vision within the local community, and we think it's time for that to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. I'd like to offer um, the agency panelists any opportunity for clarifying questions. Uh, Laurel. Kent, you mentioned some of the interpretive programming that you're hoping to do. Do you know where along the stretch you would be hoping to do those. I think in the past you said sort of on the side of pullouts, um, you described some programs that would probably require some work on the shoreline. And I know that shoreline is sort of difficult to access. So I was just curious about your vision for, for those type of activities within the section of shoreline. I think most of the interpreter program, including signage would be from Ottercrest Drive uh, along pullouts, Rodeo Point, um, the shoreline itself uh, has very limited access. Um, if, if the state park is amenable uh, and you'd want a program to be included in Ottercrest Viewpoint, uh, we're open to that, but I think uh, the focus would be on Ottercrest Drive. Thank you, uh, Jared. Just for clarity, Rodeo Point is, is State Park. I wish it wasn't for all the abandoned RVs, but it is. So that would be something for your consideration. Interesting. And I just want to confirm, Kent, that I, I heard that um, the upland boundary is uh, you guys were thinking would would actually be mean high water not up at the statutory vegetation line is that correct that is correct in our proposal we i think are very clear that the landward boundary as proposed is the uh mean high water as uh snapped to by c sketch uh we do acknowledge that in terms of management it's important to think about what is up to the vegetation line, but the plan area boundary would be mean high water. Thank you. Are there any other clarifying questions? We do have a, a short break scheduled next. So if there are no other questions, then we'll, we'll go ahead and take that. Um, and, and not seeing any, I'm going to go ahead and uh, say, let's reconvene uh, right at two o'clock. Thank you very much. See you in a bit. The, the way the site is set up. This meeting is being uh, recorded. Meets, Sorry. Meets, that's OK. Yeah, th this meets that. Um, I guess one of my uh, concerns or comments is around um, the need for for regulation since it's you know most of the regulation and I'm I'm just I'm not going to address the kelp I'll just address fish and invertebrates uh, most of those regulations are you know not there there aren't any you know additional closures or regulations proposed and the the one exception is is um, um, uh, regulating uh, invertebrate harvest of, you know, many invertebrate species, not all, on the inner tidal. And I, I just wonder what the need for that is. It doesn't, most of the inner tidal is not accessible. And that, and, and the accessible areas, many of them are pretty dangerous. If I'm, you know, recalling all aspects of the site, I'm, I, I don't know every inch of that shoreline, but but most of it's cliff or these kind of ever increasing steepness of, of a rocky shoreline that if you go down too far, you, you reach a point of no return and you fall in the ocean basically. Um, 
I'm wondering the need for having that regulation at all, because the 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 stewardship, the the management, you know, the education could happen just fine without that regulation. Um, and there really isn't a um, I think there's a harvest threat, you know, in in this part of the coastline. So that's just kind of a, a question I have. Um, concerning that aspect of it. And that might be another bullet, a different bullet on your list. I, I don't know, Andy, but that, that was, you know, one thing that came to mind. No, I, I think that that speaks directly to one of the questions that was raised in the evaluation. Uh, Kent or uh, yeah, I'll, comment. I'll yeah. comment to that. <laughs> um, certainly the area has uh, within the intertidal um, invertebrate harvest would be low uh, historically and now um, technologies in the future. I don't know, there could be things, but the species that we have a lot of information about and ODFW manages closely crabs, clams. We know how harvest works with those. We know what depths of populations. Um, other species that are not typically harvested not a wealth of information about them. Um, so I see it as a cautious conservation to uh, have closure on those until we have a better understanding of what the populations are, what species there are. Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it is probably a, a, a minor harvest at this point, um, but I think you know, with lack of information um, being cautious uh, is prudent uh, for the health of the system. Okay, and I guess I guess my my main point on this isn't so much whether it's advisable to be cautious. So I think if you had a proposed area that had you know uh, an accessible, substantial intertidal area, yeah, it probably would be a good idea to be be cautious, but the. The difference here is the area is, you know, primarily inaccessible, um, and and so it's kind of de facto protected due to its, you know, lack of accessibility. Um, so it's it, it makes it a little bit harder to justify the need um, for the regulation because of that. And again, um, you you correctly identified that. The real focus of our proposal is the stewardship, the education, and the community engagement. Um, that's the heart of this proposal. Uh, the invertebrate harvest, um, it's not essential to, I think, what we're trying to, what we hope to accomplish with this uh, designation. Um, so I, I view it as ancillary, um, and I think, you know, if we were to change that to no uh, restrictions on a, on harvest of invertebrates, I'd want to go back to our stakeholders and discuss that. But uh, it's not at the heart of our proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dennis, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, I would just point out that there is accessible uh, areas uh, north of Cape Fallweather itself. And in fact, a lot of the residents of Morocco fish there. I wouldn't put it in a classification of tide pool at this point in time, but uh, it is rocky um, and it is accessible. Um, and, and quite a few of the Morocco residents go down. There's actually a trail down there these days. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's totally inaccessible. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that information. I think it's helpful. I guess consistent with um, with with Dave's question about the need for uh, the regulation, um, I, I have a question about that in for subtitle kelp as well. And there is already a, a prohibition on on any sort of commercial uh, kelp or, or seaweed harvest in subtitle um, by DSL. Um, so. Are you aware of any harvest or, or use? And, and I think, 
you know, I guess clarification on that point would be valuable as well. I'm not aware of harvests of kelp in that area. And Dennis, maybe uh, you could add to that. Um, but it's the amount of harvest for personal use. Um, it's notable um, in a healthy kelp forest that's not under stress, probably could sustain that uh, without any concerns. But um, we don't have healthy kelp forests. Um, and it is a habitat of uh, priority that's been identified. Um, so, and the structure of kelp forests is so essential to the whole community. Um, uh, on any harvest of it, um, it doesn't make sense to me um, unless you have healthy systems. Go ahead, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, I'm unaware of any data about harvesting for recreational purposes, but I can tell you that uh, that area from foul weather all the way up to Depot Bay is just totally full of recreational boats. So it's quite possible that some of them have that in mind, but I, we don't have any real records of it. It's just that it's very heavily populated, especially on weekends and, and, and in the summer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess, Dave, I, I have a question about the use of the area as the comparison site uh, to the marine reserve and if if the goal of of this site in particular is stewardship and, and preservation of, of kelp um relative and you know wanting to to know an, an area outside of the reserve versus inside of the reserve i guess do you have any concerns in that regard of stewardship there's, impacting there's not it's actually a, it's actually a complex question is there's a couple of considerations um one in in general you know we looked at um you know the fact that it's uh you know not really affecting fisher and vertebrate harvest you know regulations in the site um you know, we, we had our Marine Reserve staff kind of look at that and think about it. And and their reaction was that it, it would not, that aspect of it would not interfere um, with, uh, you know, with the use of the site as a comparison area. Because, the, you know, kind of the fish and invertebrate harvest, whatever's happening or might happen in the future is not, you know, being affected by this. Um, on, uh, but uh, but another you know the other question is does extra stewardship at a site affect it and you know we've we've never really thought about that and uh, I would hate for a comparison area to be something where stewardship isn't allowed <laughs> you know to take it to the extreme and and so I think you know a comparison area is supposed to be. Um, you know, what would happen normally at a site that isn't a marine reserve. So, you know, for example, you know, there could be a closure of a harvest of a certain fish species coastwide. That would be a closure in a comparison area as well. But we're not saying that that has an impact on our data because that's something that's going to happen normally. And I would put, you know, kind of extra stewardship in that same category that that if, if a, a more focused effort happens at a site from a stewardship standpoint, that's kind of along the lines of something that will happen, you know, can happen anyway. We don't have control over it. It's not, you know, so it's, it's part of the whole picture if we're comparing with, you know, what is happening normally at, at non-marine reserve sites. Another aspect of that question though, sorry how many aspects there are, um, is, if there's like active management, like say there's an urchin culling, you know, uh, proposal at that site, um, now you're doing a, a, a pretty, you know, dramatic uh, effect. And, and um, 
I, I don't know. You know, we haven't discussed that. If that would be a concern at a comparison area or not, I, I, I kind of think it, it, it. We would we would just have to deal with it because if if that kind of um, proposal was to come through, you know, and, and we were in support of it, um, we would just have to kind of chalk that up to being, okay, this is what's happening. You know, nature throws a curve with this urchin population explosion. It's a natural event, you know, um, and management happens everywhere. And here's a management action that has to happen here. So, you know, I, I think it's just part of that whole picture of the comparison areas aren't static, you know, perfectly stable environments. The, the idea is being the marine, re, the marine reserve is more the stable environment, but the comparison areas where all this other stuff is happening. So I, I, that's kind of a vague answer, but I, I think for the most part, it wouldn't interfere, interfere with the comparison area. But if a, if a, if a dramatic management action would uh, you know, be proposed at the site, we just have to look at it carefully. But I wouldn't want to shut down that possibility in advance. Laurel is asking in the chat, if the comparison area overlaps, and I think we can take a look at that on C Sketch. Um, me... My question was, does it overlap the whole area, or just a portion of it? So, like, if something needed to happen, like the urchin calling, could it be focused outside the comparison area? It was just a question. Yeah, Andy, you should bring it up. I know it doesn't overlap the whole area completely, but I can't recall exactly what parts it overlaps. Uh, okay, let me things over. Um, also, well, well, Andy, while you're pulling that up, I want to remind people that comparison areas are not like regulatory. They're not regulatory designated areas. They're, they're you know, areas we chose for, for science reasons um, to, to be, you know, used as comparison areas for marine reserves. So, so you know, we really, we can't like think of them as the same way as like a regulatory, like closed area or restricted area in any way. Yeah, there you go. Well, it does. It does actually. So it looks like it's. Uh, yeah. Okay. It doesn't, but it doesn't cover the entire area. So there, there may actually be potentially added value of understanding stewardship in a portion of a comparison area if the entire area was used for, say, understanding uh, kelp bed habitat more broadly. Does everyone, can everyone see that clearly? So here's the, the Cape Foulweather complex proposal and the, the comparison area is underneath it. Okay, thanks for that question, Laurel. I think it was helpful to think about that geography. And there was another chat. Okay, just talking about the same thing. Well, I think that that was valuable to, to hear those those perspectives, Dave, about um, thinking about the comparison area relative to the the proposal idea. Um, do you have any questions? agency staff on monitoring, um, site monitoring. It, I guess the you can see most of the site from the, the road overlooking uh, the area with probably a couple of vantage points that you can see a majority of the site. Um, So that would go towards the any issues of enforcement. But if um, there's no regulations in the the, the subtitle for in, invertebrate harvest, you're really only thinking about kelp harvest then. Yeah, and, and kelp kelp harvest would have that uh, the same issue that Kent you know highlighted for fisher invertebrates that. That if the enforcement was to occur at the docks, you know, when the boat came back in, there'd be no way of knowing where the, if it had some kelp in it. There'd be no way of knowing where it came from. But 
So kelp enforcement would have to happen either by direct observation by, you know, an enforcement officer or like a citizen complaint and then, you know, calling an officer out there to take a look, that sort of thing. Yeah, and I would guess that would be pretty visually obvious uh, from above if that yeah. was occurring. Um, go ahead, Steve. I just wanted to confirm it would be very visually obvious. I wa have walked the autocrest loop dozens of times in the course of preparing, helping prepare this proposal and um, we've had a very clear view of the ocean and the proposed area almost all the way. Yeah. So I could see what boats were out there. Not very many, so it didn't see many at all. But uh, if they had been harvesting kelp, it would have been very obvious. Laurel, go ahead. Just a clarifying question. I, I believe you removed the intertidal personal souvenir collection of, of seaweeds. Is that accurate? I think that was something in the revisions. That would be correct. Okay. Not that I imagine hardly anybody does that in those locations because it's pretty tough to get down there. Yeah, but we looked just, at it. I mean, a gallon of seaweed is probably not going to be that big of a deal for the kelp forest. I don't think you can even get one piece of kelp in a gallon bucket. Um, so are there any other clarifications on, I guess the, the first bullet and I can, I can pull that up again, or well, actually, let me just put it in the chat. Um, so it, it seems clear to me that there, there were some modifications that were made to, the proposal to help address some of the, the challenges um, and how they related with the, the overarching goals of the site. Um, so I think that there are some improvements that, that alleviate some of those concerns. Um, I guess if I can maybe add one thing to that, since since you know the the emphasis was made that this is kind of part of a complex you know of, of protected areas and it's it seems like um, you know uh, the Otter Rock Marine Garden you know is a huge intertidal area with with you know massive amounts of use um, and it seems like you know that's the primary site uh, where you know public education stewardship education about intertidal areas can and, and should occur. And that area, you know, does have the closure to, to harvest um, already. Um, I mean, it's been in place for a long time. And and so that just like makes me think more and more that that, you know, a restriction along the other parts of the shrine isn't really as necessary. I mean, you'll you 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 have this giant audience, you know, down at uh Otter Rock Marine Garden where you, you know, where you do have a closure, you have everything's there, you know. Uh, fish and vertebrates, birds, seals, um, yeah, and has you know great opportunity for stewardship education. Um, so it seems like that it seems like that aspect of the complex is kind of already there. I don't know if this is making sense, um, but in terms of the you know kind of education and stewardship goal, it seems like that you know the fact that it does have you know if this was an isolated area, it would be maybe a little bit different than the fact that it already has is these other pieces to it um, that add to the, you know, kind of the education opportunities and public contact opportunities. Dennis, I guess uh, I'd ask if you could comment on that and also consider the <laughs> visitors that would utilize Otter Crest Drive versus Otter Rock Marine, Otter Crest Marine Garden. Are they, how much overlap? Yeah, I was just trying to unmute myself here. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it, uh, it is true. And that's really why we're there is to try to catch people who come down to the Marine Gardens and the surrounding area really uh, to, you know, to give them messages of stewardship and so on. But, you know, it's, it seems that there's a lot of traffic going on the, on the Marine, on the uh, Otter Crest Drive up there with a lot of overlooks. In fact, part of the coastal trail has been extended up there through with a four foot um, addition on the shoulder there. Uh, it gets a lot of traffic. I would say wherever you can educate people, let's do it. Because you know, even though you're not, they're not sitting there looking at the tide pool critters, um, that doesn't matter. Maybe they're headed down there um, and they probably have been there before. So it seems to me these messages are important all along that stretch, um, no matter who's there. And, and whether, you know, just the fact that they're not in that tide pool uh, doesn't matter to me. Um, Steve, yeah. And yeah, Jared. Another personal anecdote is that I have gone west of the Otter Crest Loop and down the hillside there and have noticed in one or two places ropes tied around trees, giving people, a few people, access down to the rocks below at high tide. So, they're not totally inaccessible, those areas. Thank you, Jared. I just, for clarity, as far as the stewardship on the Autocrest Drive, are you talking just signage or I'm just picturing, I mean, it's one of my favorite drives. Um, areas to drive in this central coast and the pull-offs really don't, that I can picture, they don't really allow for a volunteers car pulled over and and then somebody else to come join if that makes sense so i was just curious what was it just a signage or are you looking for more events and stuff and it's not my area i'm just kind of curious yeah it's, it's a good point I, I you know there are pull-offs and and a lot of people walking along that path so you would you would in, encounter the, the walkers but i think you're right i think the primary thing for those very small pull-offs, which may be one or two cars worth, <laughs> you know, probably be better to have interpretive signage there. Um, on the other hand, I think that the, uh, some of the docents or, or volunteers could be up on the overlook though, because that is a big parking lot. And there is an opportunity up there, I think, to uh, encounter some people. And if people like to walk, it's a wonderful walk. And that area is wide enough for people to gather together and walk up the hill and back down. It's not that far uh, on an interpretive hike, for example. Yeah. But Jared's right. I think, you know, for the, the small pullouts themselves, uh, you know, signage is probably much more appropriate interpretive vehicle. And I'd add uh, how we think about signage. Um, it's evolving QR codes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in different types of signage. Yeah, there could be a lot of very important interpretive messages in one of those little barcode things that you know, could be along the trail there, so to speak, the stopping points. OCRs, as they call them. <laughs> I don't know what the acronym is. Well, I see us beginning to organically move uh, from our first bullet um, into our, our second bullet of our conversation today, uh, which I'll, I'll put in the chat again. And that is really trying to understand and uh, the level of support and respect with kind of agencies who may need to be involved um, with other efforts for monitoring and or signage. Um, but I, I want to make sure that, that we've, we've touched on any of any last thoughts related to the first bullet, which was trying to understand the, the goal of the site relative to existing status quo and any of the other issues associated with the site monitoring enforcement or agency coordination. And I do realize that there's there's a bit of overlap there. So I think it's a natural transition that we're kind of moving from what we've already discussed into the ideas associated with how we communicate 
if this designation were to be in place, how we would communicate that to people. Well, I, you know, I, I would just say that this whole area in quite, requires a lot of interaction with the parks as we have tried to do with the Otter, Otter Rock area. And, um, you know, we don't have, we don't have any definite plans that we, and we wouldn't until we work them out with the parks department. So, I mean, this has, this is a dance that we have to do to try to make sure everybody's, you know, in sync with it and, and happy with the messages and all that sort of thing. It's, it's not something we can put in place or say we're going to put in place right now. It really requires this dialogue. I think part of the um, part of the challenge there may be uh, expectations with the new site and and managing those expectations. Um, Jared, I saw you come off mute for a second there. Did you want to say anything? I probably shouldn't, but uh, that's that's kind of what I was wondering. I didn't see how it could happen just on the Ottercrest Loop, and so it is looks like and correct me if I'm wrong, the intention would be to bring interpretation up to the state park properties, which I'm all for, but it's not something, and I, I think, Dennis, we've worked together with this, the Friends of Otter Rock and trying, but like I guess as long as people recognize there are limitations that the Parks Department can do and cannot um, do. I can't guarantee that we can allow it at some of those sites, even the signages. Is, is, if you can utilize the county roads and they can get through the archeological issues to post a sign, I would encourage that. It's gonna be years before we can do it on the state park properties. Um, and so that's, I don't, I guess I wanna have further discussions before you commit any resources towards putting anything on additional state park properties, because we're still, a lot of time is going in and we have a lot to work through just for the um, Otter Rock Marine Reserve there. And I think we focus on that, then we can build off of that and, and do what's what's realistic for both sides. I think I can speak for our stakeholders that it would really be at the discretion of OPRD if you wanted signage to occur on Otter Crest View State Park. Uh, versus the county. I think that there's lots of opportunities on Ottercrest Drive. Um, so it would really be at your discretion. And again, this uh, designation, if approved, it's our expectation it's not going to all happen at once. Um, I mean, we're still waiting for the 1994 designations to happen. So um, time is on our side here. And as to level of support, uh, like with volunteer programs, I mean, I think we've, many of us have been, I've been in that situation where somebody walks into my office and says, hey, we got three volunteers to work with you and in, in, interns. And without planning, it's, it becomes, you know, you don't know what to do, but well-trained volunteers and perhaps a statewide program where place-based groups, agencies, Work, put, get together and figure out a good training system for volunteers um, so that there is consistent messaging. The volunteers know, have the correct expectations and have the skill sets um, to do it right, I think could be a real bonus uh, to, the, to the agencies in terms of capacity, but um, racing into it without structure. Um, would not work. Any further thoughts on um, this bullet? I guess I'm not I'm sure what um, kind of the monitoring aspect of it is about. I mean, we, you know, uh, we, we do have programs where we're you know, doing, um, you know, scientific monitoring, you know, in the complex as, as well as the proposed site. So we have our marine reserves 
program that's doing ecological monitoring at the marine reserve itself, um, you know, in the comparison area. And then we also have some work in the intertidal area at uh, the marine garden. Um, this is my sea star wasting recovery type type work. So we do have a monitoring program that's doing, you know, existing work and we'll continue to do that work in the future, but we don't really have any special plans for any different or additional monitoring beyond that. And I don't know if there was maybe some thoughts about that or expectations about that. I don't think we have any anticipate, uh, we don't have any expectations uh, for any changes in monitoring to accommodate this designation, um, quite the other way around, whatever comes out of your normal protocols for monitoring that uh, would be in, helped inform the designation uh, would, would be useful. Uh, I think Dave, you and I have talked, maybe a uh, well thought out community science project may add some benefit to studies that are going on in the comparison area. Yeah. I, I think there might be a really good opportunity for um, aerial photography monitoring of the extent of the kelp beds um, as an example. It, since that, if stewardship is, is one of the big goals, um, that's what comes to my mind. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea to me. Um, the drone rules aside, <laughs> uh, that's that's a that, that's a legitimate purpose. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know that you need to use a drone from some of those vantage points. You can just you know make sure you have a a well documented location for you know for ortho photography or um, some other you know, consistent viewpoint over time. I've, I've seen some some really interesting. Uh, stakeholder <laughs> camera views where they add images re repeatedly over time from different visitors to the same online database. But um, I think there there could be a number of options associated with that. It, the, uh, the data they've gotten so far has been uh, satellite data. Uh, the drones would give you a much closer view of it if they switched over to that. So if, if that covers it for kind of the, the, the bullet about understanding support with respect to agency partner roles and, and signage, um, then I think we can, we can move on to the next bullet about concerns about equity of access to harvest and marine reserves perceptions. And I think that the, some of the changes that the the group proposed can get at some of those. Uh, Dave, I'm gonna ping pong this to you to ask if, if you would have any kind of harvest concerns if given the changes to the proposal structure that we've had, how that would kind of feel. Well, I, I guess I, I personally don't, I mean, I don't have any equity of, access harvest concerns for this site but again because i think sure there may be a few places where a few people could get down to and harvest but I, you know I, I i'm concerned about places where there's thousands of people not where there's like seven people so or 10 or 15 or whatever the number is and um so i don't have that concern but i, I still have like kind of the reverse concern there right, where i don't think a regulation is necessary um, in, in this case. And again, I'm, I'm not going to say that consistently in all, in all proposals, but in this particular case, I, I don't think it's, it's necessary. Um, the, the Marine Reserve perception issue, um, you know, I, th I still think it's there just because of the size and kind of configuration of the site and the fact that it's right near the Otter Rock Marine Reserve. And when you look at a map, it almost looks like a, a repeat of the Otter Rock Reserve. Realize that it, it would just be a perception because there's no harvest restriction, so there doesn't have that that harvest restriction aspect to it. 
which really you know solidifies the the perception of of creating a new marine reserve um I, but i still think it 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 might there might be some perception there that will will need to be dealt with if i can comment on to that um i see it as a real opportunity to educate the public again about what a comparison is why why does a marine reserve need a comparison area so um i, I, I just think it's a great learning opportunity that could benefit not only the plan area but benefit the marine reserve program in the long run and that takes you know some education and some thought mm -hmm. but it's i see it as an asset i'm wondering i'm just curious when when you when you uh interacted with like charter boat folks did they have maybe an initial reaction about it being marine reserve but then when they were told it, there wouldn't be harvest, I mean, what was your kind of conversation? How'd this go? Uh, typically it would go, are you changing harvest rate rules? And when I say no, they're like, I got other things to do. I'm not worried. Yeah. Um, if they expressed, well, what about in the future? And I said, well, actually it's ODFW's comparison site. So it's vital that it stay open to harvest. Um, they pretty much said, uh, well, we're we're comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say they're necessarily supportive of designations, um, but I think it was neutral. Um, they saw that it likely wouldn't be restricting. If it didn't restrict fishing uh, access or harvest opportunities, um, they viewed it as not on the top of their list of priorities. Okay. That that's good information. Thanks. Any other thoughts about uh, harvest or marine reserves perceptions issues from our panelists? Okay. Um, moving on to the last bullet and, and then anything else that the, the group wants to discuss. Um, this was really associated with uh, the site boundaries with respect to size extent and enforcement. And I think we've already had some discussion around this today that really gets at uh, the issues. Um, the, the size being uh, one that looks similar to like the Otter Rock Marine Reserve, like like Dave just mentioned, but if, if it's really focused on stewardship and doesn't change fish um, or invertebrate regulations in the subtitle, then I feel like that's, that's addressed. Um, and enforcement. And I'm going to take a look at my other notes to see um, what's in there. But again, I, I think with the, the stress on volunteer programs, stewardship, and education being one of the main drivers, um, I don't have any other further questions or concerns about those issues. Um, anyone else from our state agency panelists? Yeah, I, I have a few. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Comments on this aspect. None of them are major, but um, I, I think, you know, when you think about enforcement um, and, um, you know, people, OSP officers say standing on shore, you know, binoculars watching boats. Um, it, it, unless the outer boundary of the site would be a little bit difficult to judge from shore, you know, like the Marine Reserve has some obvious rocks that form, you know, parts of the outer boundary. Um, so you could stand on shore and see those rocks and you see if the boats, what side of the rocks it's on, you can make a judgment of whether or not it's in the site. Um, with, with this one, I think it's just kind of an invisible boundary in the ocean. Um, so it makes it a little more difficult that um, uh, state police, you know, deal with that at some of our marine reserves as well um, that don't have, you know, an obvious like ocean landmark 
as a boundary. And they do things like they use ranging binoculars and things like that to try to figure out distances. It's it's challenging though. So there's a little bit of enforcement complexity on, on that aspect of it. Um, and again, we're only talking about the odd boat that might harvest kelp. So there's probably not a lot of enforcement that needs, you know, this sort of needs to happen. Um, and again, it would mostly be probably predicated by someone reporting it, you know, like a charter skipper seeing someone on a private boat picking kelp or something like that. Um, but that's, I just wanted to bring that up, that that's an added complexity. Um, the, um, the other part has to do with how, how regulations would designate the site. And, you know, so far we've, we've been kind of on all these uh, shoreline, you know, related sites, we've been dependent on ODFNW regulations as the um, kind of uh, action that, that actually creates the site and creates the boundaries and such. And, um, but our regulations are really just harvest regulations. And so if you have this site that has a big subtitle area with no ODFW harvest regulations and then an intertidal area that does have it, our regulations would just talk about the intertidal area. So there really isn't a mechanism to outline the subtitle portions of the site. Um, and so, and this is this is a really getting down into the weeds of administrative complexity, not you know, but I, I think it would probably have to be a DSO rule to actually outline the site, and especially since if the regulations uh, uh, pertains to kelp harvest, similar to the marine reserves, where it was actually DSL rules that that you know set the boundaries of the sites. Um, so that's a complexity to deal with. Um, yeah. And I don't know that we have to comment on that, but, but yeah. Go ahead, Kent. I'll, I'll comment on the, the, the former. The latter uh, is a regulatory administrative complexity outside of my expertise. But we drew the line to be inclusive, inclusive of the kelp beds. And so the outer boundary, if you're not, if you're harvesting kelp, chances are you're within the boundary um, because as soon as you're outside the boundary, you don't have kelp because the depth increases very dramatically. Yeah. Well, that's good. And I guess when kelp's not there, it'd be hard to tell the boundary, but it wouldn't really matter because then there'd be no kelp to harvest. Oh, yeah. Um, but I do believe that it would be a, a designation probably by DSL if, and, and it would have a set of coordinate waypoints associated with it. Um, if a proposal like this uh, moves forward, um, Blake, is, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, I couldn't say the best way that we would outline the boundary, but that would be, you know, uh, a good way, and um, likely it would be through, you know, rulemaking that we would need to make this designation and have the restriction. So, Dave, you were correct. Um, so, right. So a DSL designation of a boundary would be accompanied by the ODFNW regulations associated with harvest and any, uh, I guess, rural changes that would be associated with parks. But I actually don't foresee any rural changes that would be necessary for implementing the site. Laurel's shaking her head. So I think that's correct. Uh, Steve. I just have a question. Would uh, a DSL rulemaking uh, be involved in other potential proposed rocky habitat 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 sites that are up for designation? Yeah, in, in particular to this one. I think each potential site has a number of considerations in, involved in that question um, for the. Cape Blanco site, I believe that we are thinking about not having a DSL administrative boundaries associated with the site. Um, I don't think we've had that 
conversation yet with uh, Coquille Point, um, but I think that would, because it's mainly intertidal, um, would would not need to have any DSL uh, rule amendment. Um, so that that's where this site is a little bit different in that it it does have a much uh, further subtitle extent, um, and that's how the state would would get at any um, establishment of the area boundaries. Laurel, go ahead. Is the clarification here that that ODFW wouldn't put that subtitle area in their sport fishing regs because there aren't any subtitle regulations that apply to ODFW. So that's not where we could draw the bound, like for the other sites, we draw the boundaries in their sport fishing regs because there are restrictions that accompany those boundaries. But in this case, you're not proposing subtitle restrictions that apply to that regulation booklet. Is that, that's the distinction right here? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Wow. So it'd be more, well, not really be different but somewhat similar to the process we went through for the marine reserves where we outlined those boundaries in dsl rules and then applied rules to agency to those boundaries but in our case there would be no rule changes well for a question on that like if if your rules um let me see, I, I could be wrong on this. If your rules basically say, if it's a, you know, a designated area that uh, algae harvest is not allowed, right? And so if this case, a designated area would allow algae harvest in the under title, would you have to have some rule change to address that? Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I've thought about that, Dave. I don't, I don't have an easy answer. Um, there might need to be a tweak to it to, you know, say, except in the case of. Yeah. Well, in this instance, yeah. marine conservation areas are a new category of, of site. So because they may have variable uh, regulations, there would likely need to be specificity per site to apply them. If they, yeah, if they have that variability in the ones that are being implemented. So, if, I mean, this is, is this the only one? No, well, it depends on which ones go through as to which ones would need rulemaking and whether or not we'd have to do rulemaking at all. Getting down in the seaweeds here. Um. <laughs> I would just add one comment to uh, the size and extent. Um, for this site and a lot of sites that we'll be seeing coming through the, this process, uh, there are some areas that trampling is an issue. This is not one of them. Uh, over harvest is not occurring here, but the big elephant in the room and the real stressor is climate change. And so I think uh, to address climate change and the issues that were associated with it, we need we need to be bold. It's not a time to be uh, diminutive. Um, and so I think that there's there is merit to the size of this proposal. Thank you. Um... So I'm beginning to sense, and let me just check to see if there were any other questions from agency staff about uh, the proposal. Um, as as modified by uh, the the team and and brought to us today, um, I, I think we've we've had pretty thorough conversations about about each of these uh, points. Um, Laurel? I was just going to point out that, that that conversation about the rulemaking is sort of interesting in that if, if you don't allow seaweed harvest, we have to probably go to rulemaking for this area. If you do allow seaweed harvest, we 
you prohibit if you prohibit seaweed harvest recreational that we don't have to go to rulemaking if you allow it we probably do just so you <laughs> so that's sort of interesting is that clear to the group no okay so the the rules in division 21 say that all the areas rain gardens research reserves none of them allow um recreational harvest of, of seaweed currently, they're all excluded. So marine reserves, marine gardens, research reserves, unless you get a permit. So like in research reserves, somebody can get a permit to collect for research purposes, but recreational harvest is excluded um, in all those categories. So we would just have to write another line, you know, for marine conservation areas. And for this one, we would write, you know, that it is allowed. Um, but it would be different than the other the other categories. That's why we don't have to go to rulemaking for like the Coquille Point Marine Garden or Cape Blanco because they are yeah. not allowing souvenir harvest of seaweeds. Sorry, I just I, wanted to clarify it in case it was confusing to folks because <laughs> it's a little well, I bit think, odd. I think, I think well, it's, a, it's a general point and why I always, you know, throw out the question about whether a certain regulation is necessary or not, because it, 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 the regulation, doing regulations is really complex. It's, the, it's always easy to end up with all these unintended consequences. So in cases where regulation really isn't necessary, so there's a cost, not only a monetary cost, but there's kind of a social cost of, of doing regulations. And so it's not like free, it's not like a free trade-off, like the, the regulation could only help, it couldn't hurt. Um, it, it, so there, there has to be enough of a benefit of a regulation to, you know, to get past that cost. And, 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 and again, just this discussion just show the complexity of regulations and the sooner, and the more complex you get, the more confused, confusing these regulations are, the harder they are to enforce, the more chance that people could accidentally break the law, you know, that sort of thing. And we try, we try to do our best to, to avoid all of that, that, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why, like I say, I, I, I really want us all to think about, you know, need for, for certain regulations and in, in achieving goals. Go ahead, Don. Um, it took me a while to figure out how to raise my hand. I don't think I've ever done that before. Anyway, um, I, my question is, uh, we are we're trying to make that aspect of it simple um and so if we were to say that harvest harvest restrictions would be consistent with whatever is already on the books at oprd for mcas or or something like that so you would not have to do any rulemaking. I mean, and this is really getting into implementation because these are recommendations, not you got to do this. However, I'm just thinking that there is a way to do this so that it it's not going to remove all the complexity because this is a whole new process. Like you said, MCAs are flexible. That was built into the process. However, that's an area that we are, we would be more than happy to say um, you know, intertidal restrictions are consistent with the current policy. Does that make sense? Instead of having a, it, instead of saying yay or nay. I don't know. Did that make sense, Laurel? It did. I mean, in this case, I mean, it's really hard to get down there. I really don't think there's a lot of folks going down there collecting from the intertidal in those areas. So yeah. Okay. I, I'm not concerned, really concerned about it either way, but okay. Actually, if I could bring up kind of one more thing, um, cause, cause Kent, I think said it during the presentation and then Don, you just mentioned it, the, the, the fact that these are recommendations and the, I guess we should try to clarify that because, uh, cause basically if, if, if OPAC adopts, you know, these uh, proposals, um, the, the agencies can't take them as recommendations and make separate decisions. They're, we are required to implement them. So they're, 
once it gets adopted by OPAC, it's no longer a recommendation. It's it's um, it's it's a statement of fact that here agencies, this is what you have to implement. So I don't know if maybe these are being thought of as a little bit differently, if they are in fact some kind of flexible, if there is some different flexibility in these. And Andy, I don't know if you wanna speak to that. Yeah, Dave, I think that's the a challenge with the marine conservation area category because it's different than, um, and, and does allow flexibility compar comparatively to a marine a research area or a marine garden or educational area, which, you know, we really did tighten the screws on to say, if, if you're going to be in this category, we, we want you to conform with the regulations in, in that category because of the, the challenge of rulemaking. Um, what, I, I, what I'm hearing is that many of the the recommendations are related to um, potential non-regulatory management measures, you know, interpretive signage, um, you know, the one you know, hard and, and fast regulatory change is the subtitle kelp harvest. Um, and, and I think that's consistent with what OPAC envisioned as a as a marine conservation area. Um, so I think like the other sites where there was some expectation by OPAC, even with the ones that they uh, you know, moved forward for designation that there needed to be a agency consultative process between the proposers and the agencies uh, like, like we're doing with the Cape Blanco area to make sure that we refine the the drawing the, of the western boundary to reflect the edge of the inner tidal. I think that there would be some flexibility to work with the communities on some of the implementation for uh, recommended management measures that are non-regulatory in nature. So I do think that there would be some flexibility there um, and that would that would come following the approval to move a site forward. But, but to be clear, if, if a site proposes closing harvest, you know, let's not use this site, let's just say hypothetically, any site proposes closing harvest to X species. I don't think there's flexibility in that, right? Mm -hmm. Then the rule would need to conform with that recommendation that, that, that OPEC that's made. That's really my question about flexibility. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. yeah, I think that one would be a hard and fast, kind of, you know, recommendation that we would need to follow. Yeah. And that, that's my understanding, so yeah. Okay. This question, uh, is there time between now and when OPAC votes in the fall to uh, find some resolution to this question of algae harvest in the intertidal, that would make it basically we're trying to we're trying to make it this most simplistic uh, approach rather than add complexity. I think the answer is, is yes. Um... Laurel, uh, you have your hand up. Sorry, I'm, I was just trying to have a clear, you know, I was trying to clarify the rulemaking piece of it, but I didn't want to convey that um, I think enforcement of anything in the intertidal there would be extremely challenging. So uh, having a rule, I mean, Jared might be able to speak to this better, but having a rule with an expectation of enforcement on the shoreline there for our, our staff to go down into a, you know, difficult to access, dangerous shoreline area is a, is a consideration too. So um, I wouldn't want to put enforcement, you know, to put enforcement staff into those positions of, you know, being in a dangerous location. So I'd rather, go, you know, write a line and rule um, if that's, you know, the preferred option for the group and the recommendation, then put people into a, you know, difficult position. 
I don't know, Jared, if you have thoughts on that. <laughs> You're hundred percent right, Laurel. I, you have to walk a quarter mile and that's like 20 minutes to get down there on county property. I'm not sending staff down there to worry about a, some seaweed when their lives at danger. Um, just like we see people tight roping across those coves, it's they might be attached to some rocks and stuff. We're not going to go down there and, and say, you're kind of being silly, you might hurt yourself. Um, staff safety is always going to come first, and that's just not a place where we can get to safely. I'm just blown away by that statement of somebody tight rope walking across the cove. Um, <laughs> No comment, I guess. Um, so, uh, I, I guess I'm I'm hearing that our the the number of points we have around our discussion are, um, I guess, coming to a resolution or or still exist. What I, what I'm going to try and do is, is summarize kind of what I've heard during our, our conversation today um, and you can kind of add on or, or ask questions or uh, provide your own perspective. Um, we certainly still have, have more time to work through things uh, if need be. Um, so if this feels premature, put your hand up, let me know. But I'm not seeing a, a lot of questions or hands raised about these issues further, so shall I proceed with that? Okay. Um, and, and just the, a, a process point, uh, once kind of our, our panel discussion ends, I'm gonna open up a, a pu the public comment opportunity and then we'll uh, follow through with the next steps and, and adjourn for the day. Um, <clears throat> So in regards to the first bullet about clarifications on the management effectiveness with respect to status quo, I think you know we had some modifications from the proposal team to uh, make the, the designation uh, easier to implement. And those were associated with the removal of the subtitle invertebrate harvest uh, recommendations. Um, there is a question still um, that, that Dave has brought up about the value of, of having regulations when uh, the, the need is still in, in question. Um, I, I think that is, is, is a bigger, broader kind of policy question for, for OPAC to wrestle with. Um, we did have conversation about uh, site monitoring uh, and understanding that it, it would actually be pretty easy to monitor the site because the one regulation that you're, you're trying to monitor and understand would be a, a kelp harvest in the subtitle and that would be easily observable from shore um, from from vantage points um, so, so that really does minimize uh, in, enforcement burden to uh, OSP, which would be um, the entity that has to, that would be uh, kind of responsible for that enforcement. Um, in terms of, of agency coordination with, with the group, I think a big component of that was associated with, with signage, uh, where signage might occur. We, we did hear that um, for, for signage and interpretive activity that would be on, on state parks land, there would there would need to be more coordination and time and potentially capacity to move forward on any of those recommendations. Um, and, and that goes to um, the next bullet, which was level of support with respect to agency and partner roles. And there, there really was a clarification by the proposal team that, that they did not want to um, put undue burdens on agencies that would be required to implement um, the uh, the site if it were to move forward. But I, I think that there, regardless of the intent, there is still 
a, a need that comes through with a new designation for some capacity within parks to um, make the an acknowledgement of the fact that the, the new site will exist. So there will be some costs with the creation of signage and educational uh, information, and that that would take coordination uh, with uh, the landowners. There uh, is really not any uh, concern at this site about harvest and equ equity of access to the harvest since the the harvest rules are, are not impacted with the exception of kelp in the subtitle and and really there's no uh, knowledge or data to inform us that that is actually an activity that um, we have a concern about but being one of the the broader goals of the site to steward the, the ecology of the area and the kelp forest there that's that is um, still a, an important part of the site um, and there, it was acknowledged that there still could be perceptions about the site being a marine reserve, but that through education um, and the, the act of, of having that dialogue and those discussions with community members to inform them that there, there really are no uh, new regulations associated with, with fishing and the activity. Uh, it's an opportunity to educate people about the value of marine reserves and about the value of understanding a comparison area um, where kind of ongoing normal activities of kind of human society would continue. Um, and then we, we had a discussion about uh, the, the size of the area specifically, maybe one of the challenges of understanding the offshore extent of the, the conservation area, um, because there's no immediate landmarks there to be able to identify the, the distance out off of shore. Um, but again, maybe that's tied back to the fact that the one regulation is focused on protection of kelp and the protection of kelp is focused really in the shallow subtitle where the kelp does exist. So the fact that the site encompasses the kelp forest and the, the actions associated with that extent would really provide a natural kind of uh, boundary to be able to use to understand the, the western edge. Um, and enforcement, if it, if it were to occur, would, would likely uh, be associated with observations uh, from land, but that interception of an, an enforcement would, would either have to occur at, at sea or at the dock. Um, but enforcement would have to connect what was happening out at sea to who was coming into the dock to be able to make that kind of uh, a judgment. Um, so, so I'll stop there. Did I, did I miss anything? Does anyone else want to provide any additional clarifying points of things I missed or uh, things I didn't get quite right? Andy, uh, and it could be just the way I heard it, but, but um, you know, you really only, you know, the intertidal regulation, you kept referring to the one regulation being the kelp regulation, but the, you know, the other proposed regulation is the, is the intertidal one. And, you, you know, you mentioned that being as more of a big picture policy issue, but, but I, I did want to stress that, you know, I, I see that sort of regulation being, you know, well justified in many of the proposals, but this, this proposal kind of stood out as it being felt like less of a need for that. So it really is specific to this proposal and not so much a big picture question, you know, for all the proposals. Okay, yeah, thank you for that clarification. I think you made that point several times during, so. Um, panelists from the Cape Fowl Weather proposal team, um, thoughts, comments, questions to, about the summary or any of the, the broader points? I think you wrapped it up well, Andy. Um, <clears throat> so concur with that. Um, and again, we, to the extent that we can be 
uh, amenable to working on things prior to OPEC's vote in the fall, we're very open to that. Okay, great. Well, I am going to uh, share my screen again. And where'd I go? There it is. Um, move us on to our next item, um, which is actually going to be uh, public comment. So let me um, modify on the fly here. And please enter in the chat um, if you are interested in providing public comment today after hearing the discussion. Uh, Uh, Laurel, you have your hand raised. I was just going to make a, a comment that last time we, there were a few questions that people had, like they yeah. weren't really like if people had questions, we allowed those in the the morning one. So I just thought if folks had questions that haven't been able to speak up, maybe they'd be more wanting. You know, they might want to have a they might have a question, but not have an official public comment. <laughs> just putting yeah. it out there. Yeah, thank you, Laurel. Um, I was going to allow comments first, but I. I will open it up to any questions, but maybe before I do that, I will hit kind of the the next steps piece because that may clarify anything about questions about what's next with um, the evaluation of, of these sites. Um, so I will uh, produce a workshop summary with my agency counterparts, um, summarizing any of the remaining concerns that uh, that we had um, and that will be uh, a part of a proposal packet that will go to OPAC. In addition, we are allowing our, our proposers to uh, generate a cover letter uh, for the site proposal and this uh, I would recommend addresses uh, comments from the workshop or any further modifications to the proposal. Uh, that the, the group would, would like to make in response to our conversation today. Um, those will be compiled together uh, with uh, the other information that was generated through the initial proposal process and, and provided to OPAC ahead of their meeting. Um, I'm hoping to get a meeting scheduled in, in June, um, and I will, I will let folks know as soon as I know that date. Uh, I do not have yet a single date that has a quorum of OPAC members yet um, available in June, so that may get pushed out. Um, but then there would be a, a decision uh, from OPAC this fall after having the opportunity to receive a presentation on the proposal and to have their own question and answer session. And to um, highlight this in particular, you know, there will be additional public comment opportunities associated with um, each of these proposals. Um, there was a suggestion earlier this morning uh, during the, the Fogarty Creek uh, workshop that uh, we actually put some sort of an informational flyer uh, informing people about the proposals and the opportunity to comment on the proposals and learn more about the proposals at the, the upcoming OPAC meeting. Um, that is something I certainly uh, would like to do as a way to, to ensure that we've uh, provide another opportunity for stakeholder outreach and engagement, um, especially for a, a selection of folks who um, are visiting the, the local kind of area. Um, but there would be public comment opportunities associated with both uh, a June and, and a fall OPAC meeting, as well as with uh, my commission meeting later on. Uh, Laurel, you have your hand raised. It was just related to the idea that I had for the Fogarty Creek one that I think that we could work together. In, um, I'm assuming 
Yes. So, I mean, Jared, Jared thinks it's a good idea for this one too, that we could post it in some relevant locations um, that get quite a bit of visibility. So, yeah, and we discussed that, having uh, it in multiple languages because of different user groups in the area. So I would assume that that would apply for this one too. Yep. Excellent. So those would be uh, the public comment opportunities. Um, and before we adjourn, I just want to open the floor. Thank, and first of all, uh, thank all of our panelists for uh, uh, participating today and, and having a, a, a great conversation. Um, I would open the floor to uh, questions and or comments from anybody else in, in the audience who has not been able to participate in the, the conversation. Uh, Andy, this is Charlie. I just yep. want to say thanks to, to everyone for this discussion. It was really helpful and um, I really appreciate uh, everybody's work on this. Yeah, I too can't say it enough. I, I really appreciate everyone's time and energy on this. It, it really shows how important this resource is to, to all of us and how we, how we want to work to make it a better, more sustainable place. Um, so if there are no other further questions or comments, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting today. Thank everyone again. And uh, I'm gonna give you more than an hour back on your time. So uh, use it wisely, go get some sunshine. If you got some sun where you are, take care. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you, Andy. Hey, hey Andy, do you have a, one second? Thank you. I do. I just was gonna point out that one of the dates on the poll for OPAC is on a, a new holiday, the Juneteenth holiday on the 20th oh. of June. So you might wanna remove that one. I shall remove that. that. One. Hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Laurel. Sorry, I was just filling out the poll. I was like, oh. It's not <laughs>